the criticism of this diet in the comments said, that diet is going to be deficient in many things, including calcium, omega-3, vitamin K1. Uh, I believe it also said thiamine and perhaps something else. But I wanted to go through many of the common nutrients that people are worried about on this type of diet and discuss why these are not an issue. On my Instagram this week, I talked about magnesium. Let's start with magnesium. If you are trying to get your recommended daily allowance for magnesium, which is around 300 milligrams for women per day and 400 milligrams for men, good luck. Because you would have to eat half a pound of peanut butter, five to six ounces of dark chocolate. And the problem with plant sources, those are the best plant sources of magnesium. The problem with plant sources of magnesium is that though that may be the raw amount of magnesium in those plants, that is certainly not the amount of magnesium that you will absorb. And the RDAs don't really account for this. They account for what you are taking in your body. They're not going to account for the bioavailability. I can tell you when I was a vegan, I was eating tons of almonds and I had the lowest magnesium I've ever had in my life to the point that I had issues associated with low magnesium because almonds are a shitty source of magnesium because it's bound, it's chelated, it's uh, in phytic acid and oxalates. So divalent cations, magnesium, calcium, zinc, selenium, these are very poorly bioavailable in nuts and seeds or beans. Don't anyone convince you that minerals are a good thing to get from nuts, seeds, and beans. They're a horrible thing to get. That's a really, way to, a really bad way to get those things because they are very poorly bioavailable. There's none that there's very little, excuse me, that's going to get absorbed because of the phytic acid and the oxalates in those foods. So what's the best source of magnesium? The best source of magnesium, in my opinion, is meat. There's about 150 milligrams per pound. Uh, you could easily get to the RDA by eating a pound or a pound and a half uh, plus milk, which is going to have magnesium plus any other foods in your diet. You'll get close. Or let's just imagine that that magnesium is much more bioavailable. You don't see magnesium deficiency on animal-based diets. It's a falsehood. Let's just frame this whole conversation with the fact that the USDA uh, database is what's used for these. It's updated every year. The, they're currently using the USDA 21. But if you look at the USDA um, version from 2021, a lot of these things have not been tested in foods since 2003 or 2007. So we'll get to that when we come to thymine. But it's important to consider that the considerations here are very poor often um, in these mineral analyses. But if you look at it, meat has a good amount of magnesium. It's much more bioavailable than other uh, plant foods. That is the end of the story. It's much more about how much magnesium you are retaining than how much magnesium you are getting if you are eating a non-processed food diet. And I think an animal-based diet is the best source of magnesium. You do not need to supplement and you do not need to take electrolytes with magnesium. You just need to include those foods in your diet and avoid the foods that will rob you of magnesium. This is why an animal-based diet is beneficial in my opinion. Seeds, nuts, grains, and beans will rob you of minerals and deplete you of minerals in your diet. So if you're getting magnesium from meat and you're eating it with beans or you're eating it with nuts, well, you can kiss some of that magnesium goodbye. So this is why I'm such a fan of an animal-based diet. Let's move on to calcium. Obviously, whoever made this comment didn't understand that an animal-based diet could include bone matrix, could include microcrystalline hydroxyapatite, could include raw dairy. That's a great source of calcium. That one is really something silly that we shouldn't even focus on. Omega-3, I talked about that earlier in this podcast, so we don't really need to talk about omega-3, but look, there's plenty of omega-3 in an animal-based diet. Criticisms of this type of diet have been uh, vitamin E in the past, although I will tell you this is one place where I think the USDA database is very wrong and needs to be recalculated. I don't know that anyone has ever looked at the amount of vitamin E in animal fat, but it must be very high. When I have checked my vitamin E levels and my client's vitamin E levels on an animal-based diet, vitamin E is at the upper range of normal, sometimes even above that upper range of normal. So it's very clear that people are not getting vitamin E deficient eating animal fat. And why would they? Animal fat is going to contain a fat-soluble vitamin like vitamin E. I also wish someone would do an analysis of animal fat for vitamin K2, because I think that uh, beef tallow probably is much higher in K2 than we believe it to be. While I'm on the topic of vitamin K, plural, Ks, um, often people will say, oh, an animal-based diet is deficient in vitamin K1. Well, guess what? The human body is very good at retro-converting vitamin K2 to vitamin K1. I remember when I went on the doctor's TV show, they said this type of diet, they were referring to a carnivore diet, is deficient in vitamin K. And it just really struck me that they had no idea that there was a difference between vitamin K1 and K2. And more importantly, that vitamin K2, the spectrum of metaquinone, specifically MK4 is probably the most bioactive one, have been associated, again, this, this is an epidemiology, uh, association in the Rotterdam study with significantly decreased rates of cardiovascular disease and calcific aortic sclerosis. I'll show that study in a moment, but 
it's very striking because where do you get vitamin K2? You almost exclusively get vitamin K2 from animal foods. Yes, you can get vitamin K2 from fermented natto, which is soybeans, but it's not from the soybeans, it's from the bacteria that are fermenting the soybeans. So the bacteria will make vitamin K2, but the best way to get vitamin K2 is things like liver or egg yolks. That is where you get this nutrient that is critical, that is crucial for cardiovascular health. People never talk about that important fact that often meat and organs or animal fats are vilified as associated with cardiovascular disease. But, but this is very important. Where are you getting the nutrients that are then associated with improvements in cardiovascular disease from animal foods? So do we think it's possible that the epidemiology studies, that these observational studies are perhaps confounded, that some of the people who are eating animal foods are also doing other bad things? This is called an unhealthy user bias because meat has been associated with rebellion for the last 70 years in Western cultures. And if you look at Eastern epidemiology observational studies, you will find that large studies, over 220,000 people across Asia, the more red meat people eat, the, the lower the rates of heart disease were in, in men and the lower the rates of breast cancer were in women. So epidemiology often reflects behaviors that are associated with socioeconomic status. In the United States, people that eat more meat are often more rebellious. In Asia, meat is associated with affluence. That is why we see those associations with epidemiology. And that is the danger of epidemiology. It's not really telling us about the meat per se. It's telling us about the behaviors that go along with it. So don't smoke, don't drink, don't ride motorcycles, get your regular health checkups and eat your red meat and organs to get your vitamin K too. 